Dr. Victoria Grieve is an Associate Professor of History teaching courses in modern U.S. history and visual culture. She received her bachelor's degree studying history, English, and women's studies at the University of Richmond in 1994. She received her master's in 19th century U.S. history from the University of Georgia and her Ph.D. in 20th century U.S. history from George Washington University. She is the proud author of the books, The Federal Art Project and the Creation of Middle Brow Culture, and Little Cold Warriors, American Childhood in the 1950s. She was recently awarded a Fulbright Scholar Award to teach U.S. history at the Universidad Federal of Minas Gerais in Belo Horizonte, Brazil next semester. Dr. Grief has been successful both in her career and in her family. She is from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania originally, but has lived in Philadelphia, Richmond, Virginia, Athens, Georgia, Austin, Texas, Washington, D.C., Portland, Oregon, and Logan, Utah. She has run at least two dozen half marathons. She coaches a girls on the run team at her daughter's elementary school, and she is learning to play tennis. <laughs> Dr. Greaves' presentation today is titled The Forgotten Wave, Labor Journalism and Mid-Century Feminism. Please join with me in welcoming Dr. Grieve. Thank you to the Global Women's Studies um, program and to the history program and for that Wonderful introduction. I'll get my notes up here. Okay, so I'm guessing that most of the people in this room are kind of familiar with our sort of textbook history of, women, of, of feminism in the United States. The usual timeline, right? So women organized in the 1820s, 1830s, about around the issue of abolition in the process become more fully aware of the magnitude of their own sort of legal inequalities and they organized to demand women's rights as well, particularly the vote. Seneca Falls in 1848 launching the suffrage movement, right? Or first wave feminism, which we can talk more about, um, which would last until 1920. And then what happens? Well, the textbook would have us think that after the successful campaign for the vote, um, women's organizations lost their single issue focus. They splintered, women became interested in different issues, problems, movements, and they splintered over the Equal Rights Amendment. Okay, labor feminists or industrial feminists opposing the ERA, right? Um, through the Great Depression, through World War II, except for Rosie the Riveter, um, and with a fierce emphasis on domesticity in the 1950s, feminism was a non-issue, okay? And then in 1963, somebody published a book, right? Somebody, I think, published a book. And the Kennedy administration's Presidential Commission on the Status of Women published a report. And suddenly, feminism was back on the national stage, right? Oh, I went too far. OK. So what? I think a lot of people don't know about this story, and the part of this story that I'm interested in is this, what happened in between 1920 and 1963, okay? And I think one way to look at this is, if you look at this uh, pamphlet here on the right, this pamphlet was published in 1952 by that same person who published that famous book in 1963, okay? In 1952, her name was Betty Goldstein. She was a reporter for the Federated Press, which was a labor news service. Right? And by 1952, she was a journalist for the United Electrical um, Union, which was the most radical, by far, union in the United States, heavily um, led by many people in the Communist Party. Okay. Um, so in short, Betty Friedan, Betty Goldstein, got her training she was introduced to issues of equality through the labor movement in the 1940s and in the 1950s, okay? The pamphlet on the left is simply another example by a woman named Eva Le Pen. Uh, she wrote Mothers in Overalls in 1943, um, arguing for federally supported childcare, not just during World War II, right, but as a right of families in the United States. So my point here is that what we call second wave feminism of the 1960s and 1970s 
was led by women who fought these battles in labor unions in the 1940s and 1950s. Okay? The women I will talk about today, not all of them became involved in second wave feminism, but several of them did. Okay? And these women are the link, right? They're that missing link between what happens in between 1920 and what happens between 1963. And I think they'd be really shocked to find out that people think feminism wasn't going on because it was certainly going on for them. So just a few points about what exactly labor feminism is, what the demands were, what these women were talking about. Equal pay, better working conditions, childcare, flexible hours, maternity leave. Um, these should sound familiar, right? Uh, but of course they opposed the Equal Rights Amendment. And the fear here was that protective legislation that working women and unions and industrial feminists had been fighting for would be lost if the ERA was passed. They were in favor of women's equality, but in a, in a more piecemeal, gradual sort of a way, so that women did not lose protective legislation that they felt was, was necessary. Okay. So as I said, this is, this is a work in progress for me. It's a book manuscript um, that I've been working on for a few years. And as it's evolved, um, you know, I've thought about what I'm trying to do here. Um, one of the things I'm trying to hash out and understand is what role um, journalism has, the labor press has, in advancing working class feminism. How are the reporters that I will introduce you to, how do they think about themselves? Um, do they think of themselves as feminists? How do they prioritize certain issues? How do they fit into a larger union movement? Um, so I'm trying to understand how their writing fits into this larger picture. And the other two sort of historiographical things that I'm working on are to revise this model of waves. I don't think in the, in the scholarly world that too many people interested in, in labor history or in, in women's history subscribe to this model of the first wave and the second wave anymore. Um, but I think in popular perceptions that's very much alive and well. Um, so I'd like to continue to revise that idea. And the other sort of um, historiographical structure that I think doesn't serve us very well is this, this idea of an old left and a new left. The old left of the 1930s and then nothing happens and then suddenly we have a new left in the 1960s. Um, there are so many continuities between these eras that I don't think that that model serves us very well. Civil rights, obviously an ongoing movement from the old left of the 1930s through the 1940s and into the 1960s. Civil liberties, pacifism, worker education, the anti-nuclear movements, all of these movements continued throughout those decades. Uh, and women were of course leaders in all of these movements. Okay, so I'm interested in these questions. I'm interested in labor feminism. I'm interested in trying to figure out how um, these working class um, journalists kind of participated in this. So how am I gonna answer these questions? What am I going to do? Where am I going to look? Well, I started to read a lot of labor and leftist newspapers. Um, so I read two union papers. One is called The Timber Worker. It's the IWA, the International Woodworkers of America paper. Um, I read the ILWU's Dispatcher, which is the Longshoremen and Warehousemen's Union paper. I read the West Coast Communist People's World paper, um, all of these from about the 1930s through the 1950s. Um, and I was looking for women, right, women's names. And I won't get into a history of women in journalism here, but really prior to the early 20th century, women, of course, wrote for newspapers, but they were restricted to the women's pages, right? Um, society news, domestic advice, recipes, that sort of thing, right? In the, it's not really until the beginning of the 20th century that women begin professional careers on the front pages, off the women's pages, with their own bylines um, in newspapers. And with World War II, of course, that process only increases, right? As uh, women reporters uh, assume the work of men who have been drafted to fight in World War II, as in many other industries. So as I read these newspapers and I see these women's names, I begin to realize that they aren't actually the employees of these newspapers. What they work for is this organization called the Federated Press. Okay. Uh, and so that is where I went next. Okay. All right. 
So I think it's kind of helpful to explain the federated press as like the associated press of the left or the associated press of, of the labor movement. Um, mainstream newspapers were not particularly friendly to unions or working people in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So the federated press was created by a variety of leftists, really, um, in 1919 as a result of the great steel strike during which labor unions were presented rather poorly um, and management was seen in a much greater light. The goal here was to pro provide fair and accurate reporting of the labor movement to the labor movement. Carl Hessler, who's the managing editor of the FP for its, it pretty much its, its, its entire existence, said the problem with the mainstream press was that it's owned by a different class of people that read it. He wanted a labor press that was created by labor people for labor readers. Okay. Um, so the federated press, um, the way it operates is, well, basically on a shoestring, um, which I actually think has a lot to do with the fact that it had a lot of women reporters. Um, but I'll get to that in a second. The way it operated is through three regional offices. They had an office in DC, an office in New York, and an office in um, Chicago. And from these three offices, a small staff um, collected news reports from correspondents all over the country. They edited them down and they put them on an 11 by 14 piece of paper is these little stories, and they mail them to all the subscribing newspapers, all these union newspapers. And the union newspapers can pick and choose what sorts of news tidbits they want to put in their own union publications. Okay, so that's kind of how it worked, okay? So as I mentioned, the staff, the actual paid staff of the Federated Press was very small, maybe three editors and Hessler himself who routinely returned his paycheck, okay? So the Federated Press relies on correspondence. And I think this has a lot to do with, with women in journalism in general, right? Um, one of the women I'll introduce you to, you know, she raised a family. She could write stories at night. Um, you know, you couldn't support a family on what the FP was able to provide for its um, correspondence. So um, I think it attracted a lot of women to work as correspondents, okay? So the FP tried to maintain a policy of neutrality. Okay, especially in the 1930s with the major labor battles between the American Federation of Labor and the CIO, which I'm not gonna get into, into right now, but labor was divided, and so Hessler tried to keep a policy of neutrality, which is great, but it eventually gets them into trouble because they publish communists and they publish all sorts of people. Um, and so in the, in the early to mid-1950s, labor becomes more conservative, they cut their subscriptions to the Federated Press, McCarthy's attacking um, the left in general, and so the Federated Press closes its doors in 1956. Okay, so there's your little history of, of the FP itself. Okay. All right, so here is what I think is the fun part. Okay, these four women who, as I've told some of you, I really love and I'm trying to keep my critical distance from, but they are just fierce, amazing, interesting, brave women. Um, so part of the trouble with my research here is that um, a lot of these women had to use pseudonyms or aliases or nom de plume because it was dangerous to write for the leftist press in the late 1940s and early 1950s. Um, so I'm going to tell you about four women. Um, Kathleen Cronin, the first set of dates is their life, and the second is the time period in which they wrote for the Federated Press. Jesse Lloyd O'Connor, Virginia Gardner, and Miriam Culkin. Um, Kathleen Cronin had about five or six different names, um, and Miriam Culkin, you might know by her, her more popular or better known name as Mim Kelber. She worked with Bella Abzug for a long time, and so she eventually becomes a leader in the second wave feminist movement. Okay. All right. So Julia Rutia, um, uh, published under the name Kathleen Cronin and lots of other names. Um, and I tried to find women with a diverse set of circumstances and diverse backgrounds. Um, Julia Rutia um, grew up in Lumbertowns um, in Oregon. She remembered 
uh, walking around with her mom, who, ev who the neighbors called the egg lady, right, um, delivering eggs. But of course, under these eggs, she had information about birth control, when it was illegal to distribute information about birth control. Uh, her father was in the IWW, who's a wobbly um, a radical labor organization at the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So she's raised in Oregon. Um, she marries a lumberman, right? She lives in company housing in a lumber town. Um, and in 1935, the um, International Woodworkers of America begin to form um, in and around Portland. She's right there. She encourages her husband to join. She joins, she forms the auxiliary. Um, and when this union tries to go CIO, right, to join the CIO instead of the AFL, there's an eight month lockout. So there's violence from the employers and there's violence from the AFL. Um, she starts writing a newspaper, she starts writing The Timber Worker. Uh, in 1936, she continues writing for the Federated Press in 1946. She writes for the People's World, which is a communist newspaper. She writes for the ILWU Dispatcher. So she writes for a lot of different union papers. She's a union woman through and through. And there's actually been an autobiography written about her. Um, it's called Sticking to the Union, in case you're interested. Um, the way I'm kind of organizing my research is by sort of the person and the um, themes that most interested them. Julia Rutia was more, most interested in race, okay? Racial issues. The feminism that these women embody is embedded in class issues, right? They don't separate them out, right, to that extent. It's a popular front sort of a politics where all of these issues are combined with a larger critique of what it means, what equality means, all right? So Cronin's big story was about the Vanport Flood of 1948. The Vanport Flood, I'll have to give you a little bit of history here. So during World War II, Henry Kaiser attracts thousands of workers to the Portland shipyards to build ships, right? There's a massive housing shortage. And so using pretty shoddy materials, they build this, this public housing project called Vanport. It's in a floodplain of the Columbia River, right? When the war ends, Portland, Oregon is not known for its welcoming um, racial policies. And so um, there's a tiny little um, African-American neighborhood called Al Albina. And so when the war ends, there are no further homes open for African-Americans, no further neighborhoods. So Memorial Day, 1948, um, there are large storms. And the city government of Portland says, totally fine, totally safe, everything will be fine. Unionized firefighters walk around Vanport and tell them that the dike is not safe and they should leave their houses. Well, it turns out that they were right, okay? There's a massive flood. It destroys, completely wipes out this very shoddy housing project. And 18,000 people are left homeless. So it creates this really clear moment in Portland's history about, well, what are we going to do with these people? And it's a turning point for civil rights uh, in, in Portland. And Julia Rutia, Kathleen Cronin, writes these stories about the Red Cross and about the neighborhood and about the people and about race, and that is the issue that she prioritizes. But while doing that, she writes about how these issues are impacting families and women and schools and children in a way that prioritizes their experiences and how these issues affect women and families. <clears throat> um, Rutia is involved in lots and lots of other things. She's an activist as well, a journal, as well as a journalist, which most of these women are. Um, she loses her civil service job, her day job, for when they figure out that she's the one who was writing all these stories. Um, she's called before the House on American Activities Committee in 1956, as all of these women are, okay? Um, her last arrest, this is why I love her, her last arrest um, was in 1975. She's 68 years old, and she and her friend Martina are on fixed incomes, right? They're retired ladies. She's on this union pension, and her electric bill keeps going up. So she and Martina get their sleeping bags and their pillows, and they go to Portland General Electric, and they sit down in the office, and they refuse to leave. And um, she makes the police pick her up. I mean, she's, she's like five feet tall, maybe 100 pounds. And she relishes this, you know? She's like, I'm not moving. You have got to pick me up and carry me out here. And they do. The cops pick up this tiny woman and drag her out, and there are cameras to take her picture. And she loves it, okay? <laughs> so she's that kind of a lady. She's a real firecracker. 
All right. Jesse Lloyd O'Connor comes from a really different background. Um, Jesse Lloyd um, was the daughter of Lola Maverick, who may um, ring some bells for some of you. Lola Maverick is the heir to a cattle fortune in Texas. She also was one of the founders of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. She's one of the women who sent Henry Ford's peace ship in 1915. Um, so sh her mom is a peace activist and a feminist, right? Her father is William Bross Lloyd, who is the son of the muckraker, Henry Demarest Lloyd, and the heir to the Chicago Tribune fortune. So she's got two major, she's, she's, she's doing well, right? Um, so she goes to Smith College, she gets a degree in economics, and like lots of other um, curious lefties, I guess, at the time, she's fascinated by what's going on in the Soviet Union. Okay, so in the 20s, she goes to the Soviet Union and she works as a reporter for the London Times and the Federated Press. So she starts to send stories to the FP um, about what's going on in the Soviet Union. She comes back to the US in 1929. She continues working for the Federated Press and Harvey O'Connor, who's the editor of, in the New York office, says, you know what? I think it might be a good idea for you to, to cover the, the textile strikes in North Carolina and Kentucky because our last reporter, well, he got shot at, um, but I think because you're a woman, you'll be fine. <laughs> this is her future husband. <laughs> so she does, she goes down to Gastonia and it's, it's a, a war zone. It is a war zone between these striking textile workers. And Jesse Lloyd takes the, the tack of talking to mothers, okay, about how this strike impacts them, how the stretch out um, system of labor in the textile mills impacts them. How um, they have to put their children to bed, then go to work, work all night, and come home because they, they know their children will be asleep home safe while they're doing that. So her take on these, these strikes is one that focuses on women's experiences during these strikes. Okay. Um, so she marries Harvey O'Connor in 1930, and they're both activists um, and writers throughout their entire lives. She is very interested in the peace movement, as her mother was, so she continues well throughout the 20th century advocating for an end to nuclear arms and the arms races and Vietnam and all of these issues, okay? Uh, she also, one of the things that I'm interested in about O'Connor is that her class position really enables her to do these things, right? Um, her independent income, McCarthy can't touch her in the way that McCarthy goes after most people, which is having them blast, blacklisted or losing their jobs. So she has this privileged position, which I find really interesting, and I'm trying to kind of figure out how that works, that, how that class dimension works in, in her case. Okay, uh, two more. Uh, Virginia Gardner um, was raised in a completely apolitical household. She grew up in Oklahoma, her father was a banker, her mother died when she was relatively young. She attended one of the first journalism programs in the country at the University of Missouri. Before that, journalism was something you did on the job, okay, um, which clearly discouraged women from pursuing um, the job, right? This way they could go to school and get a degree. Um, and she did, in fact, work her way up from the women's pages. She worked for small town newspapers on the women's pages for years until she landed her first big job at the Chicago Tribune in 1930. Now, the Chicago Tribune is a, an extremely conservative newspaper, okay? So her sort of moment comes in 1937 when she is covering the Memorial Day Massacre, okay? Another um, uh, steel strike in Chicago in 1937, and there's widespread violence, and workers and protesters are killed. So she's there covering this. She submits her story. The paper comes out the next morning, and the coverage is completely opposite, essentially, of the story that she submitted. So the paper is saying that strikers attacked the police, and there was violence on the part of the strikers, and it was, she just had this, this weird moment of realizing the importance of the press and how the politics of the situation were just wrong. So she joins the Newspaper Guild, she joins the Communist Party, okay, and she probably gets fired <laughs> from the Chicago Tribune. So of all of these women, I think Virginia Gardner is probably the biggest troublemaker. Um, 
from, the, from when she joins the Communist Party, she essentially creates her career, okay, for the next several decades. Um, this is one of her earlier stories. She worked for the Federal um, Federated Press for a pretty short time. She was in their Washington office um, during World War II. Um, she has a lot of stories about child care. Um, and when Virginia Gardner took over this job, um, she could not enter the National Press Club in Washington, D.C., right? It was the quintessential sort of boys club. There was a ticker going, you know, where they could get the news and submit it to their newspapers, but she couldn't go in there unless she was invited by a colleague to the cafeteria. So she literally, she has, at this point, she's a single mother. It's 1942. She's not getting child support. She has a full-time job, which she can't really do because she can't enter the National Press Building. Um, so she becomes probably the ma most outspoken feminist. She calls herself a feminist, whereas these other women don't necessarily claim that, that sort of word. Um, so Virginia Gardner works for the Federated Press. She works for the New Masses and the Daily Worker and uh, Masses and Mainstream and People's World. So she also works for the leftist and primarily the communist press uh, throughout her life. And when she wasn't working for them, she worked in factories. Okay, so she also was union woman, working class, and a journalist, okay? So all of those sorts of identities at once, okay? She brings up some interesting issues for me in that, you know, you, you would like to think that as a member of the Communist Party and working for these leftist organizations that they had um, good experience as employees as well. Mm, you know, sometimes um, it turns out that on the Daily Worker, the assumption was that she was getting child support from her ex-husband, and so she was paid as a single person, right? Um, so for years, she was paid as a single person while she was a single mother, and there were pay scales. Here's a, a um, single person's pay. Here's a single person with one dependent, which was assumed to be the wife. Here's a single person with two dependents, et cetera. Um, so she becomes the most sort of outspoken feminist at the time. Okay. Here's my last journalist. Okay. Um, Miriam Culkin. Uh, is a kind of a New Yorker through and through. She was raised in the Bronx. She was raised during the Depression um, with her mother and her brother. Her parents um, also were divorced. Uh, she goes to Hunter College, uh, um, New York University, where she meets Bella Abzug. Um, and right out of college, and she says this in an oral history that's in the archives at Hunter, she says, I'm one of the lucky ones that graduated at the right time. She graduated in 1943, and she said, all these opportunities for women um, to, to become journalists. So she finds a job within six months with the Federated Press, and she stays with them from 1943 until they close their doors in 1956. Um, she starts out as a reporter. She covers the first meeting of the United Nations in San Francisco, but she also, like Betty Friedan, who she worked with in the New York office uh, during, at this time, um, she cuts her teeth on labor issues, right? And I don't think she needed to introduce to these issues, perhaps, as um, Virginia Gardner might have needed since she grew up in Depression-era New York. Um, but she, she cuts her professional teeth in the labor movement on these issues, okay? In her later career, so in the late 1950s, she, she raises two daughters. In 1961, she's one of the founders of Women's Strike for Peace. Uh, in 1971, she and Bella Abzug join forces as Abzug runs for a congresswoman from New York. They work in the Carter administration together, and she writes many, many, many books and articles about women's par political participation, um, um, uh, she has this famous, uh, she said, um, you know, a stag senate, there were no women in the senate at the time, she said a stag senate is a stag nation, okay, encouraging women's participation in the political process. Um, the, last she, the last organization she helped to co-found was the Women's Environmental and Development Organization, or WIDO, uh, in 1990, and they are a global women's um, organization that are, today are in, in, in interested in how climate change um, unequally impacts women in developing nations, and so it's still a very active organization. So all of these women, I think, predate the term intersectional feminism. So I don't think feminism was not happening from 1920 to 1960, and I don't think that intersectional feminism is new, right? I think that that's exactly what these women were doing, right? We're talking about a working class movement 
coming out of the unions, working with activists and all other sorts of different movements in the civil rights movement, in the pacifist movement, right? It's multiracial, it's multi-ethnic. These folks are concerned with exposing corporate greed and marching in the streets about it, right? They are writing routinely, Julia Rutia writes routinely about police brutality against African Americans in the 1940s and in the 1950s. There's an organization called the American Association for the Protection of the Foreign Born. If you were a really outspoken radical and you didn't have citizenship, you were deportation efforts, Harry Bridges, for example, was routine to try to silence those voices by deporting them, okay? Civil liberties, McCarthy. The O'Connors were very active in creating an organization to protect civil rights against McCarthy's abuses in the 1940s and 1950s. So I think that that's one of the values of knowing the names of these women. It's not, to me, this isn't an add them and fill in that gap kind of a women's history. It's an add them to the story and the story changes, right? In how we think about old left, new left, and how we think about first wave, second wave, and how we think about are we having waves or this, is there all this intergenerational uh, between Gen X and first wave and second wave and fourth wave? And I don't think so, right? Because I think that this period of feminism is doing what you guys, these young people today, think, well, they never did that before, right? We're gonna do that. But I think there are some models, right? And I think there's a really sort of vibrant feminism going on today, and I think that's just how it goes with a movement that's both an intellectual tradition and a social movement at the same time. It's messy, right? There are radicals and conservatives and moderates and whatever, but I think that these women and this time period can really provide some ongoing inspiration. I suppose. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'm happy to open a conversation or answer any questions. Oh, sorry, you have a response. Um, as Dr. Victoria Greaves' talks demonstrates, academics, we often categorize history and other things in order to discuss it, but these categories often hide the true complexity and variety that maybe is in that category. In the case of feminism, which is a hugely broad spectrum of opinions and movements and people, we find strength in this very diversity. Feminism is a movement that demands action. As the labor movement forced change by, un by unionizing, educating, and agitating, feminist women were involved, and we still are. As we move forward and demand more in women's rights and global human rights, we can remember that the legacy of women is not static, and it is something that we can look to as we m march and ch move for change and learn from their examples of action. We can also remember that the intersections of class and gender and racial identity and marriage and children and all of these things with all aspects of identity help us in fighting what we believe in. All right, okay, so now we are going to have a Q&A session. So if anyone has questions, they'd like to ask if you could line up at the microphone right there. And I'm going to uh, start with a question of my own. So I'm curious, um, I have a specific question about uh, Jessie Lloyd O'Connor in particular. Um, you said that she w um, wasn't in, like, what it was a higher uh, privilege, if you will, if I can use that word, than some of these other women who seem to have, like, a direct hand in these issues. And I was just wondering what motivated her to cover these issues and be a voice for this labor um, this labor movement, if you will, if she um, didn't have a hand in these specific issues. Um, I think part of um, what I'm trying to understand is how, um, how these women were raised and how that impacts where they go, like what extent does your family have on your politics in some ways. Um, she comes from a very liberal reformist family, a very political family, and um, I wouldn't say that she didn't have a direct hand in these things. When she married Harvey O'Connor, she agreed to work as a journalist. She agreed to live as a journalist's wife. And she kind of followed a Carnegie model, right? She gave away enormous amounts of money to these causes throughout her lifetime. Um, so she was a journalist and she participated in writing. They moved to uh, Pittsburgh together to cover strikes there. They moved to various parts of the country. They moved back to the Soviet Union for a while to cover events there. So I think she lived these things partially out of sort of uh, 
idealism and commitment, and she just thought these things were important. The luxury she had was that she could act on them without worrying about how she was going to get her next meal, right? Where not all, and not everyone who was interested in progressive causes had that luxury. Right? You talked a lot. Oh, this is not. Oh. Hello. Oh, there we go. Okay, I'm just going to like eat the microphone. So you talked a lot about in your remarks about how so much of that labor history and labor feminism has been lost. And how much of that do you think is attributable to the institutional political resistance to the labor movement that persists to this day? Um, I think quite a lot of it. I think there is far more um, women's history taught than labor history in a lot of ways. My students... Um, when you know when we talk about those big names in women's history, they know those big names, but they don't know big labor events. They don't know about big strikes. So I think you know one of the bigger gaps might be labor history, um, because when you read labor history, you can s the women are are not missing, right, from the story of labor history, and they're not missing from the story of feminism, obviously. But I think if if there was more attention to working class unions and labor history in general, we may be, this kind of story about feminism would be better known as well. Yeah. Hi. Um, <laughs> okay, so I was listening about Kathleen Cronin and she was super interesting. You mentioned that she was interested. Yeah, I don't think Closer? Okay, is this better? Okay, I'll just talk loud. How about that? I can yeah. do that real easy. Okay, so um, Kathleen Cronin, you said she was interested in racial issues, um, racial, inter racial interest issues. Um, said that totally wrong, but anyway. So, um, so she was covering at one point the Albina town that was overcome by a flood. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of wondering if you could tell me more about her strategies for interviewing the African American minority within feminist groups to kind of protect the validity or like... Um, make sure that their story was as represented as they said it, or if she did any partnerships with African-American women or anyone within that class. Okay. Um, yeah, Kathleen Cronin was a, as she called it, you know, a union woman through and through. Um, and she worked really hard to integrate the unions in which she was involved. She would go to the NAACP offices in Portland routinely to gather news from the African-American Afri community in um, Portland, and the ILWU, the International Longshoremen's and Warehousemen's Union, um, which is a mouthful, um, was in an integrated union as well. So she had access to um, African American perspectives, and she followed up on them, right? And she chased down stories of um, police brutality in African American communities, where really, in mainstream newspapers, that was not it reported, it was not of interest, but she, for whatever reason, was really interested in exposing these sorts of things, right? Her other major story was uncovering a story of um, corruption within Portland city government where um, businesses were paying off judges to convict people of minor misdeeds and then put them in jail during, and then a, a farmer on Sovie Island, which is right near Portland, could use convict labor on his farm, okay? So she, was, she f tracked down these stories, and she was really an incredible investigative reporter. Um, and those were just the issues that really motivated her. So she made it happen. She talked to union members. She talked to the NAACP. She talked to the police. She, she made it happen. <laughs> yeah. um, doesn't work. So I'll just speak really loud, too. Um, Okay, so okay, I'll still talk into it. Um, okay, there we go. Um, so my question I was wondering about was, I guess, the influence of um, of Marxism into the um, desire for a lot of these women to promote labor feminism, because mm -hmm. um, you know you mentioned a connection a lot with you know the Communist Party mm -hmm. with a lot of them, and I'm just wondering what that uh, what that influence was into their into their um, mindsets and into their beliefs. That's a great question, and um, I'm trying to figure that out, actually. <laughs> um, so Virginia Gardner and Miriam Colkin were both members of the Communist Party. Gardner stayed in the party for a long time. Um, Colkin left the party about the same time she left the Federal Federated Press with the, with, um, the denunciations of Stalin, right, um, in the 1950s. Um, and so I'm trying to figure that out. The policy of neutrality 
at the Federated Press accounts for the reason that Virginia Gardner was only there for two years. She could not do it. <laughs> she could not maintain that neutrality. Um, and so um, she was repeatedly sort of chided and saying, you have to try to prevent to present both sides of the story. Um, and when you read her stories, you can hear a lot of Marx's terminology and vocabulary that you don't hear from Colkin. Um, and it might be a personality thing, but Gardner was um, a troublemaker. And she, I don't think, could not do that. I don't think she could prevent that analysis from entering into her journalism, whereas Colkin could, I think. And um, so it's in that's a really interesting question to me because I'm trying to also understand um, how the left functioned during this time. There, was, there were really blurry lines on the left. Communists worked with non-communists and progressive and liberal, and it was really kind of messy, right? Um, and the Communist Party allowed women positions of leadership long before the two mainstream parties allowed um, leadership positions for women. So I'm interested in how women entered the Communist Party for those reasons, because they could be leaders in that party. Um, they could be influential. They could be union leaders. Um, so it's sort of a blurry area for me still, um, but clearly... Um, you know, the Federated Press itself was trying to maintain sort of a political space where they couldn't be attacked, and Gardner was not able to do that, whereas Culkin was able to do that. Thank you. Sure. Hi. Um, so I was wondering about the opposition that these women faced within labor unions, and because um, I mean, I know there's there's the progressive of the 30s and 40s about labor unions, but that is not necessarily like women's rights focused. So I was wondering how much uh, struggle did they have even getting their foot in the door to do the research and reporting that they did? Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll use Betty Friedan as an example, even though um, she's not up here. Um, so one of the editors in the New York office, his name was Mark Stone, right? As veterans returned from World War II, um, women lose those jobs, right? Um, and Mark Stone um, was not a fan of working with women, and he actively tried to get, you know, rid of the women in that office. And Betty Friedan said, fine, I'm out of here, and she went to the UE. Um, Culkin stayed. Um, so even within these progressive spaces where you hope to see better, you know, there were a lot of those same sorts of issues that feminists in the 1960s realized when they joined, you know, SDS or the civil mm -hmm. rights movement, right? They expect some higher level of equality and may or may not have found it. Um, Rutia worked in, in, in unions that, you know, she worked from the auxiliaries often. Um, so, you know, you have these organizations for the women union members. Um, so I don't know that there was um, terrible resistance to them um, as union members, like in the Newspaper Guild, for example. Um, and Rutia never really talks about resistance. She, was, she wasn't having it a lot of the time. She sort of made things happen. Um, so I don't, you know, other than these sorts of um, institutionalized places, um, like on the Daily Worker and the pay issue, or you know, trying to get rid of women after World War II. There are plenty of examples like that and not being allowed into the National Press Club. So they did. I mean, they faced all of these sorts of, of institutionalized sort of obstacles to their work and lack of childcare, and it's just sometimes amazes me that <laughs> they could do everything they did. Cool, thank you. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask, uh, you mentioned that for sure Kathleen Cronin and also probably Virginia Gardner lost their jobs after they were discovered in, uh, as journalists or social activists. Mm -hmm. Do you know or think that these four women's work led to protection against this type of termination for women who came after them? Uh, no, I don't, because I don't think it was a gender issue. Uh -huh. It was a political issue, okay. right? It was a, a leftist political issue. Um, so um, McCormick, who on the um, Chicago Tribune is a notorious conservative, and he tried to get rid of the newspaper guild, people of all genders, right? So it was a, a political issue. 
Um, so that's why Virginia Gardner um, was fired. And yeah, Rutia worked for the city government um, as a clerk, and when they realized that she was writing for the, for the labor press um, and sort of exposing um, the poor um, performance of the city government, she also was, was fired. So I don't think that that instituted any sorts of um, employment protection for women okay. later. Um, and under McCarthy, there were no sorts of employment you know, guarantees for for mm -hmm. communists or, you know, accused communists either. Right. Okay. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Oh, sorry about that. <coughs> so you mentioned uh, Culkin's involvement in advocating for women to be more involved in politics. Mm -hmm. Have you seen or heard of any uh, significant statistical increase in women being involved in politics after or during her time advocating? Um, yeah, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't say that Colkin was personally responsible yeah. for that, right? We're talking about the feminist movement as a whole being responsible for increasing women's political participation and par participation in many, many, many other fields. But that was an issue that was really important to her. Um, and I think what she brought from the labor movement was unless you're participating politically, your voice is not going to be heard. So I think she learned that through the labor movement. She learned how to publicize issues on the Federated Press. All of these women learned how to demonstrate, right, and how to be in the streets and how to make their voices heard. They learned that, as did civil rights activists, from the labor movement, from Highlander Folk School, from, you know, for all these institutions that existed from the old left, they were training grounds for these folks. Um, and so I would not attribute that to Colkin, but that was an issue that was very important to her that she took into the second wave feminist movement from these earlier experiences. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mark, thank you so much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you for having me.